Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, my name is Adam Marshall. I'm the Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you this morning to the latest webinar in the British Chambers of Commerce Global Insights Series. During this series, we are welcoming senior leaders from across the world of business, politics, economics, and beyond to share their perspectives with us on both the UK and the global economy at this important moment of change and uncertainty. I'd like to begin today, if I can, by extending my warmest welcome to members of the BCC's network of accredited chambers of commerce all across the United Kingdom, and to members of our global business network who are joining us this morning or evening from all across the world. A few bits of housekeeping, ladies and gentlemen, for today's event, if I may. Uh, the first is that our event today is being recorded. Uh, the second is that we have media colleagues present with us on the call. So everything that is said today is in fact on the record. Um, our guest will speak first, then I will put forward a few questions myself and then moderate a series of audience questions, which you can submit from the very beginning of the event via the Q&A function here on the Zoom platform. When you do submit a question, it's always helpful to have your name, your organization, and where you're writing from today, uh, just as that helps myself uh, and it helps our guest understand your perspective and your point of view. My apologies in advance if I don't have time to take all of the questions we receive. This is a high demand event today, but I will do my best to pose just as many of them as I can. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our speaker and our guest this morning truly needs little introduction. Andrew Bailey has been governor of the Bank of England since the 16th of March, 2020. Um, as you will know, he's had a distinguished career at the bank at the PRA, at the FCA, et cetera. But rather than repeat a biography that I know so many of you on the call today already know, I just really wanted to mention the following. During his very first days in the role, uh, as the coronavirus crisis closed in on the UK and as parts of the economy began to shut down as the country went into lockdown, Andrew rang me to discuss what we in Chambers of Commerce were seeing in business conditions on the ground. And ever since that moment in time, he has made time repeatedly to check in and to hear the latest data and insight from our chamber business communities, uh, including our quarterly economic survey and our coronavirus business impacts tracker. Today, with everything that's going on in terms of the latest coronavirus developments, and with exactly 100 days to go until the end of the Brexit transition period, Andrew is once again making time to be with us at the British Chambers of Commerce this morning. Now, central bankers around the world sometimes acquire a bit of a reputation as having a certain distance from the businesses and the localities that they, that they may oversee. Uh, I can very much say that that's not the case here in the United Kingdom and, and not the case with the Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey. Uh, Andrew, thank you for your constant engagement and your constant interest. Um, I would like to invite you to speak now to kick us off and then I'll facilitate some questions and discussion thereafter. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Bailey. Well, thank you, Adam, and thank you for those very kind words of introduction. And can I add my words to those of Adam to thank all members of the Chambers of Commerce who support and give information uh, and their assessment of the economy to the Bank of England. Um, it's absolutely crucial. You know, our, our regional agents, we, we cover the whole country, are very much reliant on the tremendous contacts we have throughout the economy. And I can assure you, as I know my predecessors have, that that information is you know, directly fed by our agents and other staff to the Monetary Policy Committee. And it provides an invaluable uh, source of information, and actually also an invaluable sort of test for us on what we're seeing in, in, in the pretty sort of large array of information and data that we get from other sources. But I can tell you that there's no substitute for having a sort of first-hand um, you know, interpretation, first-hand view, of what's going on. So I, I want, to, want to just want to reiterate how grateful I am to the support that you all give to us at the Bank of England. 
So let me give a few opening remarks on, on, on where we are in, in terms of where we think we are in terms of the economy. Uh, obviously, as Adam rightly said, it's an interesting time. We perhaps didn't predict this when we uh, set today up, but the timing is obviously interesting. And it, it, interestingly, if, if I were to sum it up, it's a sort of story of, sort of some ways that there's a, there's a glass half full version of the story and there's a glass half empty version of the story. And let me very briefly sort of tell those two parts of the story. So let me start with the glass half full story. Um, the recovery uh, of the economy since the, um, obviously the major downturn and a sudden downturn in the early spring has been you know, quite rapid and quite substantial. We're, when we look now at the third quarter, um, obviously which, is, which is still a little way to go, we actually think that the recovery in the third quarter is probably a little bit ahead of where we thought it was in the, uh, monetary policy report that we published at the beginning of August, a little bit ahead of where it was. Um, uh, and that is, again, a story which is built on the, uh, on the recovery of the economy, really from sort of, I suppose, about sort of May onwards, actually. And that's good news. Um, but, but, I'm afraid, there's obviously another story. And another story has a, has a few parts to it. So let me draw out those parts though, briefly. First of all, that glass half full version that I, I told, um, below the surface, there is a very uneven mix of recovery. In a sense, we all know this. It's a story we know well. Um, some sectors of the economy less affected by the, the restrictions. Some sectors of the economy recovered faster than the opening up. Of course, some have barely recovered at all. So it is a very uneven story. It's also uneven because we've seen quite interesting and again probably unsurprising you know, changes in the economy. I think the best example I always quote is retail sales. Look at the level of retail sales in, in the height of the summer. Um, it was actually it was touching in some, in some points actually above where it was a year previously before COVID. However, within that there were some you know some quite big things going on underneath it. One was quite a distinct pattern of shift again um, what we tend to call delayable consumption, things that you can choose to do when you want to do them, uh, quite strong, lots of, you know, quite strong in areas like, you know, household repairs, do it yourself. Um, social consumption, which involves, you know, much more sort of obviously personal interaction, quite a lot weaker. Qu quite a marked shift in the composition of retail sales from, uh, you know, in-store to online. Um, no surprise there, it's obviously well documented in a lot of the reporting. So this, this uneven mix has also quite an element of, of change involved in it. That's the first part of it. Second part, yeah, we are seeing weak labour demand in the recovery. It's very hard to read the labour market statistics at the moment. I don't, I don't criticise the ONS at all, it's a very hard job they have. Um, but if you piece together all the many parts to it, our best sense at the moment from the Bank of England is that unemployment is higher than its, than its reported number. Um, and that comes from looking at both the, the, the payroll data, the vacancies data, level of inactivity. So we do think that un, un, underlying unemployment is higher than reported. We, labor demand is weak at the moment. So that's the second part of the story. Consumption has been the strongest part of the economy. Investment has been very weak. And if anything, over the summer, I think the evidence we got, including obviously from many, many of our contacts, including chamber members, is that if anything, investment intentions probably weakened over the summer. That's certainly what our decision maker panel uh, was telling us. On the other hand, the housing market is, is, is strong at the moment, um, associated with, I think, the, obviously the you know, stamp duty action. So again, a very mixed story. The second, if you like, important leg of this glass half empty story is that irrespective of, um, I'll come back to what's going to happen next. I think it's fair to say that, you know, to borrow a phrase from rugby, I think the hard yards are ahead of us. We think that based on that story about the third quarter being a bit stronger than we thought it might, might be in the uh, March policy report, it's still in terms of level of uh, overall economic activity, probably, you know, seven to 10% below where it was at the end of last year, i.e. before COVID. And seven to 10% is a major, major, obviously, you know, downturn and recession in any economy. It's a, it's a huge number when you look at it in that context. So it's important to look at it in that context. 
The second point about what I call the hard yard story is that obviously, given going back to my point about unevenness, that those sectors that represent that sort of seven to ten that are concentrated in that, that uneven seven to ten percent are obviously struggling uh, to, 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 to recover and obviously are, you know, are going to be affected by the news that we're, you know, we're hearing this week. So that's every reason to believe that the pace of recovery, come back to what's going to happen on COVID in a moment, was, was going to get harder anyway. That's also the case because obviously we, we were very cognizant in, in August when we did the forecast that there was quite a, obviously quite a wide range of possible evolutions of COVID. The August forecast had, had the white for activity, had the widest ever array of uncertainty that the Monetary Policy Committee has, has had in our forecast in its 23 years, about one and a half times the previous wide, wide level, and it had a very big downside risk in it, the skew towards the downside. Much of that was to do with COVID, obviously. What that means is that um, the story about hard yards, obviously, partly um, is innate to itself in terms of those sectors that have suffered most, partly obviously reflects COVID itself, partly reflects the, what we call the sort of the natural caution of people to re-engage with the economy with this uncertainty around. And partly is also a longer term story about what structural change we're going to see in the economy um, in terms of those, what, you know, what parts of the economy are going to find it too hard to recover from this shock in the time available. That's very hard to judge very hard to judge. We have a, you know, we have a, a number roughly in our, in our forecast of about one and a half percent of output. Um, frankly, I don't want to give you a sense there's any science behind that because it's a very, very hard judgment to make. And you'll hear a range of numbers. But of course that structural change is important because that will also condition the labor market because it's that element of, of, you know, of, of recovery and unemployment, which can create longer term unemployment, the need to retrain workers, uh, and the danger that um, obviously you get people go out of the labor market for longer, and that's hugely important, I think, for all of us. Now, obviously, on top of what, what the latest news is that obviously we're un very unfortunately seeing a much uh, faster and larger uh, return of COVID, and that is obviously extremely difficult news for, 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 for all of us, the whole country. Uh, and I want, I want to say, obviously, that that does reinforce the, uh, you know, the downside risks we have on our forecast, first of all. It reinforces something I said, as Adam said very early on in my term as governor, when COVID first hit, that the Bank of England is here to do everything we can do within our remit and our powers to support the people and the businesses of this country, and we will do that. So let me finish just on policy itself. Um, we we've used asset purchases and quantitative easing very aggressively. It was the right thing to do. I believe it, you know, it had a very, very positive effect in the spring. We are still undertaking quantitative easing, so it is a tool in our box. We have looked hard at the question of what scope there is to cut interest rates further, and particularly negative interest rates, and I'm sure there will be a question on negative interest rates, so I'll come to that. Um, and we have, we adopted in August uh, a form of forward guidance, and, and I just want to emphasize that forward guidance because it is very important. First of all, that we stand ready to adjust policy according to the remit we have. I, I just come back to the point about supporting the people and businesses of this country within our remit. And, that, and this is really crucial. We do not intend to take any action to tighten policy, even if we've got a forecast that shows that the economy in, its, in our central case is heading back to some form of normality until there is very clear evidence that significant progress is being made to eliminate spare capacity in the economy, this is the point about you know, whatever structural change we may go through particularly, and to achieve the inflation target of 2% sustainably. Now, I know central bankers are always, you know, um, you know, we craft our words carefully and deliberately. What that really means is that given the uncertainty I talked about, given the downside risk, we are going to need a lot of very strong evidence to start, you know, to start turning policy around when we see the economy recovering, because at the moment, as we unfortunately are seeing all too much, you know, at the moment this week, there is a huge amount of uncertainty. Uh, we see a, obviously a major threat in terms of the re return of COVID, and it's therefore our job to support the economy, to support the people of this country, and support the businesses of this country, and we will do that to the best of our ability.
So let me stop there, Adam. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. A, a, an extremely unequivocal statement repeated several times during that last part of your uh, speech and something I think that will be appreciated by the many businesses on this call. Uh, and that was one of the first questions really that I wanted to put to you. It may feel like ages ago now, but you, you had told a central bank symposium fairly recently that the Bank of England is not out of firepower by any means yeah. to support yes. the economy and tackle the crisis. You, you started to unpack that a bit for us yes. now. I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about some of the, the, the areas that you've mentioned. You talked about you've talked about negative rates, you've talked about forward guidance, and you've talked also, I think very importantly, about the intention not to tighten policy uh, in order mm -hmm. to give the economy time to strengthen as much as possible. What more yeah. can you say? Because I know a lot of businesses on this call will want some more reassurance on what that could mean in the real world for them. Yeah. Well, let me, yes, that's a terrific question, Adam. So let me, let me do that. I mean, let me do that in two parts. Let me just go back to the guidance again and, and, and really put it into a bit of context. And, you know, let me put it in a bit of context. If you follow what goes on in the United States and what the Federal Reserve has done recently, which is to say, again, within a different sort of slightly different framework of wanting to use an averaging approach to inflation, uh, to looking forward to inflation. But in many ways, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge amount of common ground between what we do. If you go back to 2013 for a moment, Mark Carney um, you know, led the, in a sense, with George Osborne, a, a, a quite a significant revision of the framework of inflation targeting. And let me put it into context. So we've had this regime for 23 years now. Not well, over 23 years, actually. The first decade up to the financial crisis was remarkably benign. <laughs> and actually, to be, to be, to be honest, that's, that's obviously an easy judgment to make with hindsight. Oh, we've had a financial crisis and now a public health crisis. Um, but also, actually, I mean, I was involved in much policy in, in, in the early days of the committee. And we did actually, we were very cognizant that it was, in a sense, sometimes almost too good to be true and that we would you know, face harder times to come. I don't think any of us could have predicted what they would be. The, the, the next, you know, the, well, sorry, the, the, the 13 or so years since then have been anything but benign. We've had two major global crises, um, uh, which has you know, been the dominant, obviously, uh, influences. And I think it's natural, to, and, and this really is what Jay Powell, you know, the, the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve said, that we have to, in a sense, make sure that we get the best of having what we in the, in, in the sort of, say, in the language of central bank is called a nominal anchor, something that is credible and people can believe in, which is the inflation target, which anchors people's expectations. But I think the message of the last 13 years is that we need, you know, we need, we need flexibility in how we put that policy framework into effect. You know, putting it into effect in a world of big shocks going on is harder than in a benign world. It stay with the blind and the obvious in many ways, but it, but it does need more flexibility. Now, what Mark Carney and George Osborne did was to say, you know, let's have a, a, a degree of flexibility, particularly in certain conditions, about over what period of time you know, we return inflation to target, accepting that that could result in you know, overshoots and undershoots where it's appropriate. And I think that's sensible. Federal Reserve has done it the same what they've announced slightly differently, but in many ways it's, it's a lot of common ground in saying let's average it over a period of time. Interestingly, we've got, if you average inflation over the last decade or so in the two countries, you get a different story. We're a bit above target, they're below target, but I don't put much, too much weight at the moment on that. What I would say is both of us are going to, you know, in a sense, are stating quite clearly that we're going to use that flexibility and, and our guidance underlines that. We will be flexible because, as I said in the guidance says, we need a lot of confidence in a world of such high uncertainty and such big change that the economy really is heading back on track. So that's the first point. Um, and guidance is a tool in that, in that sense. I and mean, it really is a tool you know, to allow people to understand you know, our thinking and how it, will, how it will most likely evolve. Let me come to rates. Um, I said the other day that, you know, I look back at things that Mark and I said um, in, <laughs> in what seems like this prehistoric era, which is actually about, about January. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what's happened since then. And, you know, we both talked about on you know, the Treasury Select Committee, particularly about, you know, how much headroom did we think we had left uh, in policy? And we were both, I think, quite cautious about it. What we've learned since then is that we've had a major shock. 
and we've had to evolve, um, and the world has evolved around us obviously as well, to expand the amount of headroom. So we've been able to do a lot more quantitative easing. Um, we've used guidance. And in the run-up to the August Monetary Policy Report, you know, we, we really had to tackle this question about is there a lower bound on interest rates? Now, what we published in August in the Monetary Policy Report was an assessment of the work we did, drawing up a, a, on a lot of evidence from particularly continental European countries, the Euro area, Denmark, Sweden, and Japan, uh, about their experiences. It's a mixed bag, to be honest, the experiences, I would say. And I think it's a mixed bag for at least two reasons which we set out. One, because the impact of negative rates does depend upon the structure, particularly the structure of the banking industry. On the whole, retail deposit rates do not go negative. There's pretty good reasons for that. So the higher the amount of retail funding you have in your banking system, the less, the less the impact of the central bank putting its policy rate negative is likely to be. And we do have quite a high proportion of retail deposits in this country. And we have to structurally reinforce that by ring fencing of banks. That's the first point. Second point does depend on, um, actually I have a third point as well, but the second point is it does depend also on the point in the economic cycle that you use them at. I think we, sort of, again, we begin to learn that from other countries, but there's not always a case, the case studies are quite few and far between. Third point I would emphasize is that I think there's a big piece of what I might call public communication and public expectations because, you know, I think the public would rightly be sort of puzzled and say, well, I thought there was a basic principle in life that when I sort of, you know, when I put my money with you, you pay me a, a return on it. And now you're telling me, you know, it's the other way around. Although, as I say, the quali qualification of that it's the point I just made on retail rates. So, you know, it's a, yeah, there are real challenges with the policy, but the conclusion we made in August was that, you know, it is something that we should have in the tool bag um, uh, as an option. Now, a lot of people have asked what, what to make of the statement we made last week. The statement we made in the Mets last week is, is, I think, very clear, but let me just explain it a bit. What the MPC said was that we are now moving on to the, what I might call more technical work, operational work, to say, were we, put that very much in the conditional, to wish to do this, and I'm going to come back to that point in a moment, how well prepared is, this, is the financial system in particular and the economy more generally? Now, let me emphasize, this is, there is no surprise in us saying this. We cannot, it would be a tremendous error, it would be a cardinal sin in my view, if we, had a, if we stated that we had a, a tool in the box, which in practice we didn't actually think we you know, operationally could be used because a lot of that is down to IT systems and so on. You know, can you actually put a negative number into an IT system in a bank? Uh, so it's no surprise that we're going to do this work. Um, it's going to take you know, a little bit of time because it's got quite a lot of technical complexity in it. But it's important. You know, I'm not going to have a situation, and my, my fellow committee members agree, where we say, yes, yes, we've got the headroom to do this, but in fact, we know that we don't know. How, you know we don't know whether we can actually do it. That's intolerable. So nobody should read it more than that, really, into it. That that's the next stage of the work. What I would emphasize is that what that means is, yes, it's in the tool bag, but it doesn't imply anything about the probability of us. You know, using negative interest rates at the moment. And there's been a lot of speculation that this morning I'm going to make some great revelation on this subject. So I'm afraid I'm not going to say anything more than that because that's the honest truth. That's where we are. So Thank let you. Me stop there. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you'll be unsurprised to know that of the 23 odd questions we've had flowing through, about 20. <laughs> I've asked have been 20 <laughs> So it's, 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 it's in the toolbox, and what you're saying to us is that we are going to have to wait and see whether, whether the tool comes out of the box for any use. Well, what we're going to do next is actually make sure you know, that it can be used. And, and I say that, that the, that's, in, that's in the sort of the plumbing, if you like, because, say, we've got, we've got to work with banks uh, to say, you know, if you put a negative number into your IT systems, um, you know, does it blow your system up? I, I, I'll overstate this for the sake of simplification, but you know, does it blow your system up or does it not? I mean, by the way, were we to want to set a zero interest rate, and, and I'm not speculating again that we would do, we would have to ask the same question because obviously it's a well-known fact that if you divide something by zero, you sort of blow a, you, you, know, you, you blow a bit of arithmetic up. So, you know, these are, these are quite sort of, I'm afraid, quite basic practical questions.
Yes, yeah, so we have we have the economic impacts question and we have the computer yeah. sector question, yeah. both yeah. of which are of interest. Yeah. Um, let me bring in a couple of the questions that we've had from the audience that sort of go into this topic a sure. little bit, a little bit more, but again without uh, infringing on the policy decision, which you've already sure, said. Sure. In the future. Um, Mark Newton, who's managing director of LMK Thermosafe Limited, has asked. You know, of course, there's been talk of potential negative interest rates, uh, but his question is, you know, how will these be of benefit to the wider economy if they are used? And the point Mark is making here is many of us are holding larger than traditional cash balances yeah. at particular yeah. moments in time, and that's been of great benefit as a cushion during the lockdown period. So you have, you know, companies on both sides of this spectrum, effectively, uh, those who might benefit and those who might have concerns. Could you comment a bit on that? Yeah, so it's interesting. So I made a point a few minutes ago that if you look at some of the work done, um, actually particularly by the European Central Bank to evaluate their own experience with negative rates, they implemented negative rates in many ways in what I might call the upturn in the cycle because they had, they had the euro area crisis slightly late, obviously later, a bit later than the um, global financial crisis. Uh, and they implemented negative rates really in the sort of in, in the upturn phase from that from that crisis. And the work that they've done would suggest that it's really interesting to the point you just made, Adam, that putting particularly putting wholesale and corporate deposit rates negative as opposed to individuals' rates negative, incentivized to some degree people who were holding cash balances. To, you, to, to, you know, to, to, to to invest in the sense, that, you know, if, if people have got a choice, let's say hypothetically, between holding a cash balance in a bank, a business that's, that's holding cash balance and investing, then the ECB's conclusion would be that, you know, on on average, there was some incentive given to businesses to make that make that to make that decision in favour of investment. Um, now that, as I say, depends upon. The particular context in which you would use negative rates and that's why in, in what we published in August we were quite careful to say I don't think you know we don't think you should generalize that conclusion um, it, and it does bear out the fact that you know, there's no question I think that the transmit what we call the transmission of interest rates does change as you well, it changes as you get there in it to zero and it probably certainly changes as you go negative uh, it will be different uh, both in terms of timing and in terms of uh, strength. But that was the effect that, that say, we, we, you know, we saw from other countries in that context. That, that's really helpful because it, it, it answers a second question which I had from Bruna Scarica, which was given that negative rates have thus far been employed in countries and monetary blocks where currency had appreciated and inflation expectations had sunk, what would the tool achieve in the UK where neither seems to be the case at the moment? You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's that theoretical question and the ECB's experience to date there. Um, yes. If, if, if I may, Andrew, just you know, move on to a couple of other audience questions which are coming in thick and fast for you. Uh, Neil mm -hmm. Campbell, who's a commercial director, has asked something about the economic indicators that you use at the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, uh, my chance to make a plug for the British Chambers of Commerce Quarterly That's Economic good. Survey and its, uh, its centrality yes. in terms of MPC deliberations. But also, yeah. one of the things we've noticed over the course of the crisis is that you've had a hunger for real-time data and yes. quicker data in order to inform what you're doing. We've tried to furnish some of that. We know you've been on yeah. to footfall and a lot of other less traditional yeah. So is real-time data taking on a bigger importance to decision-making for the bank uh, at this particular moment in time, in particular? So, yeah, well, let me, let me confirm. I mean, Chambers of Commerce data is, we, we have an insatiable hunger for data. So um, Chambers of Commerce data is extremely valuable. And I, you know, as you were saying in the introduction, I think we really value the, you know, the contribution that the Chambers of Commerce make. And it's, uh, so we are insatiable consumers of data. So it's a really interesting question. Um, let me uh, give a personal reflection on it to start with and then, then develop the point. I, I, I was out of the bank at the SCA for just over four years and I was involved in financial stability at the bank. So I was still on the FPC, but I was a bit further away from the MPC during that period. So I was very impressed when I came. One of the things that really impressed me when I came back was how much the bank has invested in and, uh, and, and, and developed its, uh, its use of real-time data and fast, far more technical fast data. Um, Interestingly, I, I'll be honest with you, a lot of that was done in the context of wanting to do contingency planning for the effects of, you know, particularly the disruptive 
uh, Brexit. So um, that was in many ways, I think, the sort of the, the motivator for some of it, plus the fact that you know, much greater access to data is obviously coming around. So in terms of what, let me, let me be honest and say, well, what, it, what does it do and what doesn't it do? And it sort of goes back to my glass half full, glass half empty story. So it has helped us a lot to um, understand the short term trajectory of the economy. So I would say, although it's obviously still early days in a statistical sense, that our sort of, you know, our, our forecast errors on short term indicators now are, are lower. And certainly, and this was interesting, you know, we, we, you know, we, we've been criticized over the summer for being too optimistic about the recovery. Actually, if anything, the recovery has been slightly faster than we thought it would be. And much of the position that we took on that, on that very short term recovery, so what's it going to be in the next month or two, was based on the, you know, on, on, on the real time data, and particularly on payments data, as you say, on mobility data, uh, and those sorts of things. And, and that's, a, I mean, that's a great help to us. Where I would, where I would however, be cautious is, um, you know, if, I, if, if you look at some of the, obviously the glass half empty parts of the story, which we're looking forwards, further forwards, obviously, you know, there are limits to what you can, uh, you can adduce from, you know, from real time data uh, on, on some of those questions, but it gives you a, you know, it gives you a much sounder and stronger sense of your starting point, I would say. Well, the, the, those, of, those of us sort of at the core face in the real economy sort of think that it does add something to the debate yeah, that, definitely, definitely. that you may otherwise, that you may otherwise lack when you've got backward facing data. Like yeah. that. Um, I, I, if I can, I, I'd, li I'd like to come on to a couple of other areas, um, uh, Andrew, which people are asking us about. Um, one is around debt and the, and the amount of debt that has been amassed by businesses through the pandemic. Mm. Uh, many taking on government backed loans, uh, many actually, you know, nothing to do with government, simply going to their banks and financial institutions and, and having to seek working capital through, through those means as well. Yeah. Um, we had a question from Lawrence Beardmore at Western North Yorkshire Chamber um, saying, what can we do about the situation that some businesses find themselves in regarding debt? Those companies that have done the right thing, keeping going by taking on more debt in whatever form to keep staff employed, but could now find themselves penalized by banks for being too highly geared. Could this COVID debt be handled separately and perhaps guaranteed by the Bank of England? And I suppose that relates to a second debt question from Graham Dixon at Esprit Warehousing in Manchester. And Graham is asking, what are the Bank of England's views on the likely effect on the economy of the deferred costs and debt which companies are now accruing, whether it's VAT, bounce back loans, Sybil's payments, etc.? All yeah. of which we know comes to a, a point of inflection in, in spring of 2021. You know, you and I have discussed it as the, as the month 13 problem and what that might do to, to working capital and to businesses. Just wondering if you can comment on this in, in light of the calls from us and many others for solutions both on debt and on recapitalization. Yeah, no, it's a very important point. I mean, I think that, first of all, uh, you know, and I, I'll, I think the measures that have been put in place and that the Chancellor has put in place uh, over the course of the, well, the last six months, uh, both if you think about two major buckets of those measures, the, 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 the business lending measures and the furloughing scheme, I think have been absolutely essential um, to support the economy. Um, and you know, I've been very, very strong supporter of, the, of, you know, of, of those measures, and Chancellor and I have worked very closely on them, and I think, you know, I think they've had a big effect, because I think if you think about the sort of what would it have been like without them, it's, it sort of doesn't matter anything about it. So I think they've been very effective. The question, you know, rightly, is obviously what next? And, and that's a question for the Chancellor, not for me, but I'll, I, so I'm, I'm not going to offer precise uh, remedies at all. What I would say is this. Um, I think there's a number of issues we now face generally sort of macro level if you like obviously one is, is what's going to happen on covid the second one comes back to the point i made in the introductory remarks that you know we do observe that the rapid growth that we've seen rapid recovery we've seen has been uneven and so you've got this more now more concentrated piece in terms of you know, you know if you look at who's you know who's using the furloughing scheme today or who's drawing down you know, drawing down still on the lending schemes and I think that you know that does suggest that it's important in terms of thinking about policies to now think about policies that are sort of targeted at the issues that we face 
The third thing and final thing I'd say about this, I think, is again, you know, it's, 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 it's an important question for the Chancellor, but it obviously has an important impact for the Bank of England in terms of the way we think about the economy. But I think it's now, it's, it's important, obviously, to think about the sort of the path of, of, of working this debt out. Um, and I, you know, I know that that is very much uppermost in, certainly in our minds. Um, I, think it's, it's, it, it, I think there are sensible outcomes that can be had here. Obviously, the challenge we face today is, that it, is, is it's you know, slightly three-dimensional chess at the moment. You've got to think about that path together with, obviously, what COVID is, you know, what, 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 what impact of, the, of COVID, COVID is going to be. But I think that in there, um, and certainly looking at it through a macroeconomic policy lens, it's important to take advantage of what I might call sort of all the options we have for businesses to enable them to, in a sense, sort of smooth out the path of adjusting back from this debt position. Now, the last thing I'd say, and this is not a prediction on monetary policy, it's a longer term observation, is that I think there's every reason to believe that over the, the coming years, whatever the economic conditions we face, we are in a world of structurally more lower interest rates for a period to come. And by the way, that was true before COVID ever came along. There are, there are reasons in the world economy why that is happening. And, and I expect that to persist irrespective of where COVID goes to. Thank you, uh, Andrew, for that. Um, we will continue to be pushing, as you might expect, for some resolution on oh. some of those debt issues. Yes. And what you said just now, about the profiling of that debt, trying to help businesses manage cash yeah. is gonna be ex extremely, extremely Very important. important. Yeah. Um, uh, because of course we wanna make sure that they have maximum working capital and that when the time is right, of course, growth capital as well, uh, because yeah. there is gonna come a time when we come out the other end of this tunnel and we are going to need to see yeah. businesses with adequate finance to grow. Yeah, and, and I think, if I may say so, Adam, I think it's important that there are, there's a sort of, there's a menu of choices for businesses because obviously, you know, they're not, businesses are not in the same place looking forward. Some will want to do one thing and some will want to do a different thing. And I think that's perfectly possible to envisage. Yes, absolutely. And many of them, Andrew, will be competing uh, against businesses elsewhere in the world. Um, uh, we know that the bank, of course, monitors the global outlook just as carefully as yeah. it does mm -hmm. the UK domestic outlook. We had a question from Andrew Seaton, who is now at the Hong Kong Association, but was for a number of years the extremely successful chief executive of the British Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. Um, and Andrew's asked, you know, the UK is very dependent on international trade and investment flows, as we know. Um, allowing for all the uncertainties, how does the bank see growth prospects in some of the major global economies? And then how does it see that impacting back on us here in the UK? Well, I think, um, obviously, the first thing to say about the global economy is, that, of course, there's an element of commonality, which is the COVID threat. In many ways, in other parts of the world, doesn't look vastly dissimilar to here. Um, timing can be slightly different, but the basic, you know, the basic elements of it are very similar. So that's, uh, in a sense, that, that's an element of what I might call almost, almost common shock um, that we're seeing in, in the world economy. And broadly speaking, when we look at our profile, of, you know, our forecast profile of the world economy, we see something a little bit similar to, to, to what I described to the UK, that if anything, the recovery of the world economy has been a bit faster than we thought it would be. But um, you know, obviously, as I was saying, the glass half empty you know, part of the story applies equally to, to other parts of the world economy and accepting different, different conditions across countries. But the basic narrative is, 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 not, is, is not that different, actually. So that's the first point. I mean, the second point I would make, and I, you know, I think it's particularly obviously relevant to, um, uh, you know, to well, let's be honest, to someone like Hong Kong, is you know, I'm a very, very strong supporter of free trade. I'm a very strong supporter of open markets. Um, one of the risks that we, I, I talked about the downside risks in our forecast, I talked about COVID. Yeah, let's be honest, one of the other risks that we, we have out there in the world economy at the moment is, is, is you know, trade effects coming from other sources, as well as COVID. COVID, of course, has reduced trade. There's no question about that uh, this year. Um, and, and one of those is obviously tensions in, uh, you know, in, in world trading conditions. And, you know, I will just say from, you know, Bank of England is obviously not, <laughs> not party to those, those issues directly, but from, again, from a macroeconomic point of view, I would very firmly say that it is in the interests of all parties, it seems to me, in the world economy that we have open markets um, and trade that follows from those. 
I think you'll find broad agreement to that statement from many yeah. of the business people on the call. Yeah. Of course, a big part of that is the UK EU relationship. We are a hundred mm. days from the end of the transition. Yes. We do not yep. yet know where the politicians will land in terms of the ongoing negotiations, although the vast majority of businesses hope that that lands with some sort of uh, agreed outcome. Um, mm. But there is, of course, the very real possibility that we do not get that. Um, a lot of businesses have been asking us, you know, you know, the bank is talking about the tools it has in its locker to deal with the COVID crisis. Are, do you have tools in your locker to deal with uh, the potential of a disorderly scenario at the end of the year as well, uh, if the Brexit transition ends without a deal between the two parties? Well, uh, first of all, um, again, I mean, let me, in a sense, make the same, make the general point again, which is that, you know, I think there's no question, and I, I think this is true for both both parties to the negotiation. I think it's as true for the European Union as this for the UK, but I do think that an outcome that results in a trade agreement is a better one. No question about that. Um, and, you know, I can understand, you know, and, I, I, and therefore it's important that it seems to me that process of negotiation continues. Um, in terms of tools that we have, um, obviously, I mean, our, our toolkit is essentially the same, of course, but the question is how would we deploy it? And again, you're, you're right. So, you know, we've got this um, obviously interesting um, issue around a, a mixture of risks that we've now got. We've got a very big COVID risk. But let's be honest, yes, of course, we have got a risk from uh, disruption to trade um, and disruption to, to the economic uh, consequences of that, were there to be, um, uh, were that to follow from the, from the process of the trade negotiation. The tools we have are, say, are essentially the same ones, but we would use them, you know, again, what I said about the response to COVID and what I said about our, you know, our responsibility to do everything we can to support people and businesses in this country. I mean, it's as true for that, uh, for that eventuality as it is for COVID. Uh, and we will certainly do that. Um, I mean, we, we watch the situation very carefully. Um, you know, there are really two elements to it. One is, you know, what sort of trade agreement is, is likely to be the outcome of it. Uh, and then what are the consequences of that trade agreement in terms of business activity? And um, I can tell you that we watch it very carefully. And of course, we will be stepping that up as we go uh, further, as we uh, get towards the uh, end of the year. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we, had, we had a question from an Andrew Gray as well about one element of that, which is with specific respect to financial services in the UK. Um, where, uh, of course, the bank, together with the other regulators, has an important role. Andrew's asked, there's been much talk this week of the standing of London as a main financial centre as the end of the Brexit transition looms large. Um, how concerned are you about this large wealth-generating sector potentially contracting and the impact this could have on SMEs over the coming years? Could it become a second credit crunch? Those are Andrew's words, uh, Andrew Gray's words, not either yours or mine. No, well, it's a, it's, it's, it's a very good question. Let me say, I mean, London is a global financial center. Um, it's not a regional financial center, it's a global financial center. So part of that global financial center business is, is, is between the UK and, uh, and, and the European Union, but it's only a certain part of it. Um, there's a very large other part, a much, much, much larger other part, which is, which is global in nature. So it's important to put it into perspective in that sense, first of all. Um, I have to say, and I, I, I'll repeat something I said to the Treasury Select Committee um, two or three weeks ago, actually, I was asked about this. I mean, the, it's fairly well known that the, uh, in general terms, the, the, the process of trying to agree equivalents uh, on financial services has not gone very far at the moment, although we have had encouraging news on uh, clearing, on clear, clearing, which is very important. I mean, but I think fair to say that both we and the European Union accept that clearing is of such vital importance from a financial stability perspective that it's, it's in everybody's interest that we settle that question. I think there's, there's every reason to believe that for a period of time, at least we will. I have to say that I think it is, uh, you know, it is, it, again, consistent with what I said about free trade earlier, that it is not in anybody's interests that um, there is an attempt to uh, drive the business of the European Union out of London. Um, I, you know, strongly hold to the, to the principle of open markets. Uh, and that will be the principle we go forwards with. Um, at the moment, I, you know, I have to say that you know, the way the European Union seems to take approach this question, um, you know, there is a desire to see repatriation of business, and therefore equivalence is not 
does not appear to be on the table, um, particularly in areas, some of the biggest areas actually, such as the, um, the whole investment services and uh, investment banking services of the MIFID regulation, which the European Union currently isn't actually envisaging uh, an equivalence process on. And in one sense, I understand why, because they are in the process of revising their own rules in that area in the context of COVID. But, and this is what I said to the Treasury Select Committee, of course we should, we all, I mean, every financial regulator needs to keep their rule book open and flexible, because if you don't, if you don't you're heading for trouble. Perfectly understand why the European Union are doing it, but, you know, let's, let's be very frank. We can't have a system where we, you know, the UK you know, is, set, is told, you wait till we've decided what we want to do, we'll tell you the answer and you change your rules to match what we've done. That's, that's rule taking, we're not going to have that. So, I, you know, I'm afraid to be very blunt about this. Um, you know, it's going to take a different approach if we want to get there. Uh, because that is, that is not, a, in my view, a price that we, should, we can pay for equivalence. And we have to come back to the point I made at the beginning that London is a global financial centre. Unequivocal view, Andrew, and one which I'm yeah. sure will be reported. Thank you. Um, can, can I come on to an, an, another area which um, has been brought up by several questioners as well? I'm trying to bring in as many areas as possible, and I'm grateful to you for being so forthright and uh, so detailed in your answers too. We've had a couple of questions about the end of the furlough scheme. Obviously, something of great preoccupation to many businesses. It is a policy area determined, of course, by the Treasury and by no one else. Yeah. And the decision is the Treasury's to bring that to a close at the end of October. Um, it, it, it's obviously had an effect, uh, a, a cushioning effect on the labour market. Um, Colin Lowe has asked, you know, what's your view on the furlough? Should it be extended as some sort of targeted sector-led arrangement? Uh, and Holly Williams of PA has asked, uh, you've been supportive of the furlough scheme ending as planned on the 31st of October, but given the start of a second wave now of the pandemic and tighter restrictions coming into force, is there now a case for this to be extended? Uh, if only targeted help is offered, would this risk leaving some businesses and workers left without support? Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's a question about support as we look forward, the emergency phase coming, well, the first emergency phase anyway, coming to an end and looking no. to what happens next. Well, let me say, first of all, as I, as I said earlier, I think the furloughing scheme has been extremely successful. Um, you know, I really congratulate the Chancellor on it because it, it's been a, a scheme that has, you know, has been very successful in managing, in a sense, the, the shock to income and the shock to, to, to firms and to labour. Um, you know, and bear in mind, I mean, uh, you know, the, at the peak of it, something like 30% of private sector employees were using it, so it, it was very significant. Um, the use of it, as far as we can tell, has become more concentrated in terms of sexual effects. And there's no, I said earlier, no surprise there. I mean, obviously, we, you know, that, that follows the pattern of reopening up and, and not opening up the economy. Now, look, I'm, I'm very clearly, I'm, it is a decision for the Chancellor. I'm not going to tie the Chancellor's hands because, you know, we are living in a, as you can, we all know, in a very fast evolving world, uh, <laughs> generally, and certainly this week. So it would be completely inappropriate of me to do, do anything to, 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 in a sense, you know, tie the Chancellor's hands. It's a very difficult, you know, difficult situation right at the moment. And, you know, I fully support, you know, the decisions that, you know, he's taken and, you know, giving him the flexibility to, you know, to, to think about the implications of this. What I'll just reiterate is what I actually said at the Treasury Select Committee, which is the reason I said that I think it's sensible to, you know, to, to, to in a sense, to not continue the current scheme is precisely the point that we've moved from a sort of in a, more, a world of generalized uh, employment protection to rather more sort of specifically focused areas. And I think it's therefore sensible to sort of, in a sense, stop and rethink the approach going forwards um, without any sort of commitment as to what that would be. And that would remain my view, but allowing the flexibility that obviously the, you know, the world is changing very rapidly around us. It, it, it is indeed. And I think you'll hear from people like me requests for some further targeted support going forward. Yeah, well, I'm not worried. In, in particular about sectors that simply cannot reopen or who've seen demand crater entirely and, and, and uh, their value over the long term to the UK economy. So probably arguments from us on our side, on the business side over the coming weeks. <laughs> I, I'm sure. <laughs> no, but I mean, you, you should, of course you should make that point. Uh, um, now, Andrew, Russ Lynch at The Telegraph has, has, has asked a question, and this, this comes to the changing nature of the labour market, which of course you keep close track of, uh, which is around whether the bank has modelled how much the impact of renewed working from home could impact the economy. 
Um, and do you expect, for example, your 7.5% unemployment forecast to rise at all? Uh, my, my colleagues, uh, you know, in the BCC, my economists in the BCC thought that that might be a little bit optimistic under current conditions as well. Um, and of course, we have a polemic going on, too, around the nature of work uh, between those, including myself, who believe that businesses will work out the right form of working for the future and will find optimal productivity. And those yeah. who believe that a uh, faster return to workplaces is the only way to guarantee no, no. There's a lot of discussion there. What's the bank's view? Yeah, well, fascinating. Um, so let me just, I mean, it's a good question. So let me just say on the 7.5% start and then come on to the broader question. Um, seven and a half percent was obviously conditioned on the central case of our forecast, um, and we had, as I said earlier, there's this a very big downside risk to that to that number, which you know, a lot of which obviously is related to the evolution of COVID thereafter. Um, all I would say on people saying seven and a half percent is optimistic is the point I made uh, a few minutes ago, which is um, actually people have criticised a lot of our projections for being optimistic over the last six months, and we've turned out to you know, be near and if anything slightly slightly the other way around so we'll see we'll see but times but, but things are changing you know let's be honest, let's be honest about that and then you know, we'll go into another phase i think that the more interesting question really is is the one you put about sort of you know what will what will this do to to working patterns and and and, 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 and the way employers and firms operate i mean I can, I can in some ways i can speak best in the position of the bank of england actually I mean, i've got we've got four you know, about four and a half thousand staff I mean, first of all, like, I think like many companies, huge credit, I mean, to, to everybody, we've adapted, you know, very, very successfully in many ways to the environment that we didn't expect to be in. Um, and, you know, it, it's worked, I think, better than, um, you know, many people could have feared, really. Um, you know, I, I, I came back to find our staff, you know, in a sense of foreboding as to how, you know, everything was going to work. And then pleasantly surprised that we sort of, you know, we got going, rolled our sleeves up and got on with it sort of thing. Um, I mean, I think when I look at, when I look forwards, to be honest with you, um, I have a number of thoughts, not all of which are, well, I think, I think they're all consistent, but they're not, they're not all pointing in the same direction. So I think, first of all, I mean, I, you know, my best guess is that there will be long run impacts from this. I would be amazed if we sort of, you know, all went back to exactly as we were before COVID. I think there will be lessons learned from it and, 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 and impacts. I think in the longer term, I don't think you, you, I, don't, I don't think it's possible to sustain a sort of you know totally remote working policy for the long term because I do look at you know, so I look at the Bank of England and think well, in a way we're trading on the fact that you know many of us have worked together for years um, you know so we know each other um, you know and we don't have to sort of you know, we, we know how each other reacts to things. We don't have to be standing in front of the person to sort of know how they think as it works. That makes any sense. But then I think about, you know, look, I mean, last week we took on our, our graduate, you know, our annual graduate intake. I spoke to them last Friday on, on of course, on a, on a call like this. Um, and, you know, it's pretty tough. I mean, you think about, you know, it's all right for those of us, I say, who, you know, known, known our colleagues for years. And here are people who don't know anybody. I mean, they literally have not, you know, they've not met anybody. I mean, it's really tough. And, and of course, I think, therefore, we do need to be cognizant of the fact that as we, you know, as time goes by, more people are in that situation. I think, yeah, we, the idea that you can sustain exactly what we've got at the moment, I think, gets more difficult, frankly. So I think there will be long run effects, but I think we have to be, you know, and I think we can go on managing as we are. I don't, you know, so I look at my point of view, I think we can do that. But we do have to bear in mind that, you know, there are some parts of this that don't, I think, sustain so easily. So, so it's a watch. The, it's a watch this space from the governor. Yeah, yeah, I think many of the rest of us. Yeah, um, Andrew, time is running running short. Mm -hmm. um, but I had one final question in my mind, and I'll abuse mm -hmm. chair's privilege if I may to ask it. And it comes mm -hmm. uh, from some of what you said fairly early on in your in your remarks, where you cited the approach of the Federal Reserve. You talked about what Jay Powell was doing. Uh, yeah. uh, in, in terms of both the inflation target and how the Fed was using its powers. You also repeatedly said early on that we'll do everything we can within our remit. Uh, yeah. I think I heard the word remit several times <laughs> in, your early, yes. in, your, in your early comments. 
Um, now, of course, there's a difference between the Bank of England's remit and the Fed's remit. Um, do you see a, a possibility that in the wake of this huge change that we're living through right now, there may be a case for some change to the bank's remit, looking more towards the Fed or some other model around the world, well, given your desire to do everything you can to help jobs in the economy? Let me, yeah, it's a, really, it's a really good question to come back to Adam, actually. So let me put a couple of points of context onto that. First of all, I think both the Federal Reserve and we, and indeed other central banks, can say the same thing about ECB uh, and others. I mean, as I said earlier, you know, the, at the heart of the remit is having a nominal anchor of price stability. And I don't think any of us are you know, moving away from that, nor should we. There are differences, of course, in the remits, as you rightly say, about how you then factor in other elements of, of, of economic policy, particularly labor markets, you know, employment uh, and activity. But here I would emphasize the point I made earlier about flexible inflation targeting. I think all of us have moved over the last decade at, at various times to increase the flexibility of our regimes without throwing the sort of the bar for, the, maybe the bar for out, as it were, in terms of, um, in, in terms of the nominal anchor. And the reason I say that is, and I read sometimes people saying, you know, well, the Bank of England's, you know, now radically behind this other central bank, the Federal Reserve, let's say. And we're not, actually. I, I think there is, in practice, far little difference between, between what we're trying to do and what we're seeking to do. Um, I think we're going about it in slightly different ways, but not that different. And at the end of the day, we are both trying to balance you know, the, the importance of the nominal anchor with the flexibility to use it to get what we all want, which is you know, sustained economic activity, benefiting businesses and, and benefiting employment. You know, there isn't. It, it's easy to starkly you know, to, to oversimplify those differences. There really isn't that much difference. What we've all had to do, if I can't just emphasize this point again, over the last decade, really, is to introduce you know, sensible, sensibly more flexibility into the into the regime. Okay, so we don't you. need. We don't need a. I don't think we need a regime change to, you know, to, to get that. So, for all of us who are central bank watchers, it's action and outcome rather than structure that you're encouraging yeah. us. To yeah. Very good. Well, listen, right. this has been a wide ranging and fantastic conversation. I want to thank all those who have put in questions from across the UK and indeed from across the world to us this morning. And my thanks to, to all those who are listening in Chamber of Business Communities uh, too. Uh, Andrew, we owe you a debt of thanks uh, for the way you communicate, for how clearly you communicate, uh, and also for your willingness constantly to talk to us about what we see going on uh, so that you and your colleagues are able to take decisions uh, and, and, and steward the economy to the best of your ability as well. Thank you very much for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Of course. Thanks, Adam. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and have thanks. a great day.